You tell people do tshuva. Okay, I'll do tshuva. So I'll uh, watch your video clips. No, no, no. Come to the shul. Study. Fulfill the Torah. Keep Shabbat. It's hard for me. Okay, it's hard for you. Your life's going to be harder. What is this like? What is, why, why do we make this mistake? Why do we constantly make this mistake as a nation, as a people, as a species? Even you see sometimes Goyim, Goyim that uh, don't have necessarily the same obligation as a Jew to fulfill the Torah, but they have an obligation to fulfill their part of it, to work on themselves and so on. Stop making sins against the Torah according to what they're obligated to do. But you see them, many times you tell them, listen, whether you're a Jew or not Jew, you're not allowed to waste seed. Whether you're a Jew or not Jew, you're not allowed to be arrogant. Whether you're a Jew or not a Jew, you're not allowed to be cheap. You're not allowed to be uh, all these different, you're not allowed to be a bad person. Not to steal. Not to cheat on your wife. You're not allowed to do these things. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or not. There's certain things you're not, you're just as a human being, you're not allowed to do. Why? I'm said so. Oh, but it's hard for me. Okay, so your life's going to be harder. I gave you an instructions. I gave you a cure. You may not like it, but that's the cure. So then they ask you the wonderful question of the year. It's the best question. How do you know it's going to work? How do you know it's going to work? What? I'm just going to read this book and everything is magically going to fix itself? I'm just going to come to the shul and everything is just going to magically fix itself? What, I'm just going to, I'm going to read Parashat Shavua, I'm going to come to the shul, I'm going to work on my arrogance, I'm going to work on my, all of my uh, demented ideology, and that's just going to fix, I'm going to finally get a job, I'm going to finally find a wife, I'm going to finally find a husband, I'm going to finally get a cure for cancer, I'm finally going to get a cure for, for this disease that nobody has even an understanding of what it is. I know it's going to work. That's what they ask me. I know it's going to work. I'm just a little more theatrical. I know it's going to work. I know... Because God said so. But you're not going to believe God. Why? He didn't tell you. Personally. Like he told Moshe Rabbeinu. And even if he did, you still wouldn't listen. But if you go to the doctor because you have a little bit of a pain on the right side. You go to the doctor because your tooth hurts. You go to the doctor because your foot hurts. And the doctor that went to school for four or five years, he says to you, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Goldberg, you have to take this pill three times a day, 500 milligrams each time. You're going to want to throw up. You're going to get stomach aches. But in a week from now, you're going to be perfectly fine. And you, Mr. Goldberg, have to take this pill twice a day for the next three weeks. And in three weeks, you're going to be fine. And you're going to take their word to the bank and you're going to follow them like tatale. You're going to follow them like a nice little boy right out of the shower. You know, little kids, little two, three-year-old kids, they come out of the shower, you shower, the, you put their hair to the side, they look like little angels. That's how you take the pills. Why? My doctor said it. My doctor said it. I have to take it. Look, it says on the prescription, see, 500 milligrams three times a day. So I have to take exactly every eight hours because that's three times a day. And you take it like a little tatale, like a little trained dog. You take it. Why? Because the doctor that went to school for four or five years said so. But what about the rabbi that studied Torah for 80 years? What about Rav Ovadia that studied Torah all 94 years? What about him? He said you have to keep Shabbat because God said so. I read it in the book. He said you have to keep Talat Mishpacha because God said so. I read it in the book. 94 years I read it. 94 years he's been reading The rabbis have been reading it. You, you trust the doctor to take his medicine three times a day for two weeks even though it gives you stomach aches. Even though you don't really know if it's going to work. Even though in reality the more you know about medicine the more you know the doctor has no clue what he's doing. It's trial and error. He's giving you an antibiotic because it's simply one of the choices. He doesn't actually know if this antibiotic is going to work. He doesn't know. How do I know? I took every antibiotic under the sun. I'm an expert in antibiotics. And one time I went to a special disease doctor, someone that knows internal medicine as an expert. 
And she told me, listen, the trade secret I'm going to tell you. If the antibiotic doesn't work, meaning you don't have major relief, not it finishes everything, not cure, but major relief within 48 hours, it's the wrong antibiotic. She says, yeah, but the, the, the medicine said 7 to 10 days. I called the doctor. I'm still in pain three days later. He says, yeah, call me in four or five days. I said, I don't think I'm going to survive four or five days. He says, okay, well, hopefully you do. She says, get a different doctor. Why? You most likely like you most likely won't survive four or five days if you have a real infection. If it doesn't work within 48 hours, it's the wrong antibiotic. The doctor doesn't know. He's taking a chance because this specific symptom has five choices of antibiotics. He just gave you one of them. 20% chance of it working. 80% chance of not. But you're going to listen to him like Tata you're going to listen to them. You're going to look a little puppy. Why? Because it says MD after his name. And there's a plaque on the, on, on, on the, uh, in the entrance. It says he went to Harvard. He went to Princeton. He went to Gehenom. He went to all those places. And he has an MD for it. And you're going to listen to him. But the rabbi that studied for 90 years, you're not going to listen to. The Chachamim that have been studying the Torah for hundreds of years, you're not going to listen to. He went to school for four years. Oh, you have to listen to him. So then what are you going to say to me? You're going to say to me, no, I'm not listening to him. I'm listening to medicine. I'm listening to science. Science is proven. It's not theoretical like you think. Science is proven. I'm listening to science. Well, Rabotai, I brought you some science. And I want to know what you think of this science. In 1867 was the first time they performed a pro statectomy in order to treat cancer didn't really work in 1904 was the first radical prostatectomy pr- same procedure but just 40 years later they advanced it further by the way didn't really work people still have cancer in fact the amount of cancer increased in 1920 16 years later they started using radiation therapy for prostate cancer using radium didn't work in 1940 Huggins demonstrated a regression of prostate carcinoma through endocrine control guess what didn't work 1906 well how do we know it doesn't work because people continue getting cancer and they continue dying and the numbers continue increasing just as years passed, the amount of deaths continued to increase. In the 1960s, they had a revolutionary thing. Radiotherapy was established as an important treatment for prostate cancer. Guess what? More people are dying from cancer. Still 60 years later. In the 70s, they started using steroids and other types of androgens. Guess what? People are still dying. 1980s had to be something special. I mean, it's 80 years since we started, for heaven's sake. After 80 years, you should get something right. Long-acting, synthetic, luthanizing, hormone-releasing, hormone agonists started, guess what? People are still dying. 1995, cryosurgery was accepted as a treatment option for recurrent cancer after radiation therapy. Why? Why is there recurrent cancer? Because the treatment's not working. But you still pay a quarter million dollars for each time. You still have to mortgage your house, your business, your life, your wife, your kids, the dog too, your neighbors, everybody you're mortgaging. Why? Because they're not going to treat you unless somebody pays. 1995 failed. We're 100 years into treatment. We're still failing miserably. 2003, first gonadropin releasing hormone blocker was launched called Abarilix. People still dying. 2004, another revolutionary. As you can see, the changes and developments are coming more rapidly now. It used to be every 20, 30 years. Now it's becoming every year. 2003, 2004. 2005, 
2006, every year you have some new biopharmaceutical company come out with some drug that they believe is going to treat something. Later on, they find out that it's killing more people than healing. But once in a blue moon, they have the mercy of Hashem and it works to some extent. But we still haven't figured out the big bad cancer. So we figured, you know what? Cancer is just too big for us. Let's try to figure out something simpler. Pain. You have a headache. You have an uh, arm ache. You have a shoulder ache. You have some type of ache. They should figure out how to treat this ache. Let's see what they've done, the science. The 1700s, they decided that opium is a perfect solution. Perfect, perfect solution to treat patients, to manage their pain. Even if the pain is simply a cough, we'll give him opium. That's addictive and most likely going to kill him. He has a cough, now he's dead. Oh, what happened? Yeah, it must have been a real bad cough. Oh, you don't think it's the drug? No? You don't think about that? You're a scientist, no? No? Hundred years. They advanced. Now we're going to use morphine. Morphine became the revolutionary medicine for pain. Friedrich William of Germany isolates morphine from opium. And he calls it morphine after Morpheus, the Greek god. Guess what? People die. Instead of dealing with a throat ache, he's killing them with morphine. Advanced scientists advance a little bit more. They must be smarter 50 more years past. 1855. They start using the hypodermic needle. Alexander Wood of Scotland devises the hypodermic needle to administer morphine, the same medicine from 50 years ago, from patients that are suffering. Guess what? They die faster now. Oh, advanced another 20 years, 70s into the 90s. Physicians raise concern with morphine addiction. Oh, wow, it took him almost 90 years to figure out there's a problem. They call it necromania. Americans are now buying over-the-counter pills and elixir that contain opiates to treat menstrual cramps. A woman has a period, now she's taking morphine for it. Nice. Shtabach shimo. Scientists and geniuses. So whether they have cancer or they have just a monthly cycle, it's coming back next month, by the way, at least until it stops, 40 years from now. You have a, oh, you have a little ache. Okay, take some morphine, honey. Go, kaparalech, go. 12 years old, kaparalech, go. Take some morphine, mommy. Take, or needle. We'll put it for you. Come on. Let's go. Come on, mommy, come. Come, give me your arm. Doctor said it. He went to school for five years, 10 years. Now, technology must be getting better. We're in the 1900s. Must be getting better. We're getting smarter, no? 1900 to 1910. Free heroin. A philanthropic organization. <laughs> hey, this, uh, this would be fun. It wouldn't be funny if it wasn't true. I'm reading this from a document that Le- Light has uh, put together. A philanthropic organization provides free heroin to morphine addicts to help them quit. <laughs> this couldn't be funnier if it was fake. He's addicted to morphine, so they give him heroin. <laughs> and it's coming from a philanthropist. <laughs> I, 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 I saw it. <laughs> scientists, God bless them. God bless medicine. 1906, the Food and Drug Administration, the, the, uh, the FDA, pharmaceutical companies must accurately label their products and list dangerous ingredients. Especially if it's heroin and cocaine. <laughs> they, for, 
they got? They put it in Coca-Cola bottles in those years. That's what they did. They would give babies Coca-Cola because it would calm them. Nobody knew why until they realized it's called Coca-Cola because there's cocaine in it. That's why it's called Coca-Cola. Not today, obviously, or else the bottle would be $10,000 a bottle. But, <laughs> but, but that's how they calm down the babies. The babies come because he's high. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, this is... Oh. God bless America. Wow. <laughs> 19. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, by the way, of course, you know, the government, they can't let things go. So in 1914, the, the, there's a new tax on narcotics. <laughs> 1920s, 1920s had some major investments. Hydrocodone. Hydrocodone came into uh, as a painkiller. 1923, this legal narcotics were banned. Uh, in 1924, there was the Anti-Heroin Act, meaning last year's medicine is now banned. <laughs> last year's medicine that was uh, curing the morphine crisis is now banned. Now we advance to the 30s and 50s. Uh, there's the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to ensure consumer safety. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Just stop killing us. Uh, it will be safety. Uh, 55, you have Tylenol comes out. Tylenol comes out to help people. Uh, I think that killed less people, Baruch Hashem. In the 70s and 80s, Percocet comes out. In the 70s and 80s, Percocet comes out and Vicodin. Percocet and Vicodin come on the market. Both are short-acting relievers. In the 80s, these opiates called Percocet and Vicodin are called by everyone as safe. Safe to take, perfectly safe, no problem at all. In one letter, it says addictions are rare. Addictions are rare in patients treated with narcotics. It was published in a New England Journal of Medicine, 1980. In another study, it says chronic use of opiates uh, also, again, is a, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not creating any major problems. Anyway, advanced to the 1990s, 1996. They advanced because, you know, listen, they're used to heroin for the last hundred years. You're only giving them a little bit of... Uh, Percocet, no good. So, they bring out Oxycontin. Oxycontin, whoever made it, has to be partners with the Satan himself. Oxycontin is a long-acting painkiller. It hits the market. Aggressive marketing pain. They literally spend hundreds of millions of dollars marketing this to become the number one pill every, everywhere. Saying it's less addictive. It's less addictive than its short-acting cousins. Percocet and Vicodin. Guess what? It's at least five times stronger and more addictive. Complete outright lie. And they paid $600 million for people to keep this lie under the, uh, under the carpet. In 2002, the safe drugs, remember the Percocet and the, uh, the Vicodin that was safe and no one could add get addicted to it? In 2002, 10,000 people die from it. 2012, the number of prescriptions written for opiates, pain medicine, reaches 259 million people. Enough for every adult in the United States to have a bottle of pills. In 2015, the overdose deaths from prescription opiates and heroin reached 33,000, almost tripled the number just 15 years before. By 2006, it doubles again. 59,000. 2016 continues to increase. 2017, President Obama asked Congress for a billion dollars to fight the opiate epidemic. What do you mean? You just said it was safe 15 years ago. Said nobody could get addicted. Now we have an epidemic. Guess what? As of this study, which is actually only a couple of years old, six out of ten 
drug overdose deaths involve these pills. 60% of drug overdose. It's more dangerous than heroin. It's more dangerous than cocaine. It's more dangerous than all the medicines we've ever had before. It's also more advanced. Every day, 91 people die from it. I am positive the statistic has increased by at least 20% in the last two years. 50% of opiate prescriptions originate from a primary care physician. Now, of course, painkillers have a good, have a good in them. You need them if you are seriously in pain. But the point is not to say that they should ban painkillers simply because people need them. If you're in pain, you need a painkiller because it's very easy to become suicidal when you're in pain. But at the same token, this is just simply to show us an example of how every average kid just hurt his back, every mom that just went through a difficult pregnancy, every guy that got hurt at his job goes to the doctor, the doctor gives him a pills, tells him this is perfectly fine, this is perfectly safe, and he takes it like a little baby. Like a trained dog, he takes it, he does it, and he only realizes that a good part of the time, it's the wrong medicine. A good part of the time, it may actually kill him. A good part of the time, it wasn't the right choice. And the doctor might have known it, but he gets a bigger bonus from Big Pharma. But you'd listen to him, knowing all this stuff. Because you trust in medicine. But if I told you that there's a different medicine that doesn't change every year and has never killed a single person, and hasn't changed in over 3,300 years, meaning the doctors haven't changed their mind. The scientists haven't changed their mind. They know for sure it's the same exact formula over 3,300 years. But you're going to say, nah, it's not possible. It is. It's called Torah. But you don't want to listen to the Torah. You want to listen to the doctor. They went to school for five years because he has a certificate. If I send you a certificate, would you listen to me? I have one on the website. You can print it if you want. You know, start listening to Torah. Rabotai Karim, Torah is the only cure there is. People suffer for no reason. They suffer for no reason. You don't need to suffer. Just follow what Hashem says. What's my proof that it works, aside from countless letters? I gave you one just from a couple of days ago, Sunday. Sunday. 1.18 a.m. I get a message. Baruch Hashem, I don't know what this is, but it seems like Hashem wants me to encourage you, Rabbi Yaron. Okay, listen to this story until 45 minutes ago. Oh, listen, listen to this. Until 45 minutes ago, I had this terrible toothache, which has been torturing me for three to four days. I don't know. Personally, if I have a toothache for four days, I'm probably going to go to the dentist. But four days toothache doesn't sound like fun. And when I started to watch your videos, I started to sweat like crazy, and the toothache just dispersed Baruch Hashem may Hashem bless you and your house so now the Shiret Torah are better than your dentist and they're free instead of going to the doctor get a root canal for $3,500 all you gotta do is go on bezathashem.org press play take down some notes toothache goes away you can't make stories like this up. There's countless of them. But we don't want to listen to that. We want to listen to the easy way. But the easy way is hard. That's why in America, only 34% of American Jews say that they believe in God with certainty. That means that 66% of American Jews are not even sure if God exists. The biggest reason of why people don't want to listen is because they figure that if you listen to the Torah, 
That means that you're going to lose out on the materiality of the world. You're going to lose out on the fun things in life. There's no bigger mistake than that. Thinking that just by you listening to Hashem, you're going to lose out materially, you're going to lose out as far as fun, you're going to lose out the joy and so on, is a mistake and a half. Why? Because you simply think that, number one, what you're doing is actually good and fun, and number two, that what you're supposed to do is an error, is a problem, is no good for you. The Luach Eretz says that God grants life not only to those who learn Torah, but also to those who support Torah. Where do we know this from? The Luach Eretz says this is the reason why God does not give scholars their livelihood directly. Many times you're going to see people that learn or teach Torah Many times you're going to see that they live partly or completely off of staka. People donate to them. Some of them have fancy houses, some of them don't. Some of them have brand new cars, some of them don't have a car at all. Some people get rewarded both money and Torah, and some people only get the Torah. But they get the Panasai, just not as much. But nonetheless, it's very common for somebody that learns Torah to get his Panasai in an indirect way. Where does the Luach Eretz get this from? Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva would have debates with heretics. One of them specifically was a, name, was a heretic by the name of Tonostrophus. Tonostrophus came to Rabbi Akiva, Gdolador, giant of giants. He says to him, there has to be a mistake in this Torah of yours. He says, why? He says, you see, if your God really loves you, why does he make poor people? If, the God, if God loves you, I'm Israel. Why does he make poor people? Why does he make them poor? You know how hard it is to be poor? Every day you got to go back for change. Every day you don't know how you're going to eat. If he really loves you, why did he make you poor? A typical person that never learned Torah is stumped. Doesn't have an answer. Why? Logically, there's no answer. There's no answer. What are you going to say? God loves you, he's going to make you poor? So saying, God loves you, he's going to send you to the Holocaust. Good luck. How is your logic going to explain that? How does, you, how does your doctor, the one to four years doctor, how is he going to explain it before he kills you? How? How is he going to explain it? How does the scholar explain it? Went to Columbia University. Was a professor there. How is he going to explain it? If God loves you, why does he make poor people? There's no logical way of explaining it. There's only one way to explain it, which is what Rabbi Akiva says. To save the rest of us from Gainum. He made poor people, so the rest of us that are making sins and are destined to go to Gainum for the sins that we're making. Shem doesn't want us to send to go to Gainum because we're making sins, but we're also making some mitzvot. So to save us from Gainum, he says, you know what? You were supposed to study three hours today. Would you study three minutes? You had the book in front of you for three hours, but you're playing with the phone the whole time. You pretended like you were studying, but in reality, you're playing with your phone the whole time. Rashi says three hours later. Rashi says, "Well, what page? What, oh, book's closed. It's upside down. It's upside down. It's a newspaper. What do you think? That's free in Shemaim. It's Bitul Torah." You didn't have a job, you didn't have a wife, you didn't have anything, all day you did, you played on the internet. Guess what? Shemaim would say, oh, for that day, nice, nice, nice sentence. Three, four, five, six hundred years in Gainum for that day. Nice. Why? I gave you 24 hours, all, all day you, you, you're watching sports. All day you're playing sports, you didn't learn my Torah for one minute. So what is the person going to do? Rabbi Akiva says, go take that money you have in your pocket, give it to a Ben Torah. Give it to Am Yisrael to do tshuva. Go do that. Why? It's going to save you. It's going to save you. Why? Hashem specifically made that rabbi, that Kiruv organization, that Talmit Chacham, that Avrech, he specifically made them need the money. Why? To save you. 
Not because he doesn't love him. He loves him. That's why he's sending you to give him panasa. He promised him panasa. He's sending him panasa. If the guy doesn't care how panasa comes, if it comes through PayPal or it comes through Flipcars, if it comes through Facebook or if it comes in the mail, he doesn't care how panasa comes. But it's coming. How does he know? Hashem promised. Hashem promised. So he loves him. It's you that's the problem. You didn't stay Torah. You barely keep Shabbat. Tarat mishpacha, Hashem yachem. You touch your wife half the month. Now you have a problem. So what do you do? You know that money that Hashem put in your pocket? Rabbi Akiva says, you got to use it for Torah. You got to use it for Torah. The Tiferet Israel says something else. He says, while other types of wisdom can grant a person many good things in life. You have wisdom in medicine. You can get you a nice job like one of my former clients. He was a spinal surgeon. His day-to-day job generated $1.8 million a year for him in income. It's a good job. Got him a lot of good things in life. New car every year. House, his house was like the White House. He had all types of special animals he killed in Africa hanging on his walls. He thought it was good, so he bought it. Or he killed it. Or he did all types of things that were good things in life. This wisdom that he had in medicine, he was pretty good at it, so therefore he got a lot of good things in life. A few wives, kids with all of them. But Tiferet Israel says, only the Torah grants a man life. The other wisdoms can grant you good things in life. But the Torah grants you life. The difference is, Rabotai, is that you can live without the good things in life. But you can't live without life. The Torah is what gives you the blessing. You go to work, a lot of people work. For whatever reason or another, everybody's struggling anyway. Whether they were making $30,000 coming out of high school or $500,000 when they're already in their career for 20 years. Struggling just as much. New year, new weds, newlyweds, finished the, you know, the wedding, the balagan, the honeymoon, started real life. First kid is born. All of a sudden they hate each other. Guess what? 10, 15 years later, they together. Maybe. But they still hate each other. Why? Why? Why such miserable lives? Because they have good things in life. They have the kids, they have the car, they have the house, they have the job, they have all the good things in life. For whatever wisdom they study to get those things. But life itself, the blessing in life, you could only get from the Torah. Without Torah, there's no blessing in life. This is why you see multi-millionaires committing suicide on a weekly basis. A statistic made a uh, study done by the U.S. government, I believe it was actually the taxing department for whatever reason, or labor department, maybe about five years ago, four or five years ago, I remember reading it uh, recently, pretty much confirmed that suicide is a rich person's problem. Meaning rich people commit suicide. Yes, of course, some poor people commit suicide also, but statistically, statistically speaking, it's an overwhelmingly larger number of rich people commit suicide. Middle class to higher class to extraordinarily wealthy. Commit suicide. The Robin Williams of the world, $100 million, $200 million net worth, chokes himself with a belt. This, uh, this uh, famous uh, shoe designer, or bag designer, woman, few months ago, suicide. Anthony Bourdain, very famous chef and restauranteur and so on, TV personality, kills himself. Linkin Park, a uh, lead singer, a group, a rock and roll group, had six kids, wives, multi-million dollar business, millions of records sold, suicide. His friend, suicide two months before him. 
it's an extraordinary amount of suicide for rich people that have all the good things in life but they don't have life they have tattoos they have cars they have big holes in their ears sometimes they have weird haircuts big restaurants a lot of people like their stuff a lot of people are jealous of them until they die nobody's jealous of a dead person real story happened some years ago wealthy man very very wealthy dies and leaves his children two letters it says Banai Karim, my dear sons I only have two requests from you one the second letter don't open it until the Shiva is over the week Shiva the week day of mourning my death is completed that's when you open the second letter second request is please tell Chivat Kadisha that to bury me with socks on buy me brand new socks I want to be buried with socks now he was sick for some time so they expected that he's gonna die and when he died he gave him the he got the he got these two letters so they call Chivat Kadisha they said listen we have uh, one request our father very well known very well respected buildings houses roads all he did in his life he has one request he wants to uh, be buried with uh, socks on so what Kadisha says we're sorry we cannot do it we cannot bury him with socks on no what do you mean you can't you know who my father was you have to bury him with it's all he wants he to come on you have to fulfill his wishes no we don't we cannot bury him with socks on there's no allahic permission to bury anyone with clothes on all you get is that nice little white robe they wrapped you in a talit that's all you get no socks that's the Allah no socks because that's the Allah that's why no ma- no socks no pants we're not going green get buried with suits five thousand dollar suits they get five thousand during their life they wore t-shirts but when they die they wear a five thousand dollar suit we're not green you came here naked you go out naked no socks after arguing back and forth with Kadisha, there's nothing you can do either we bury him with nothing or go find somebody else go find a goy to bury him we're not burying him. poor kids what they're gonna do they bury the father no socks on they're very upset number one that he died number two they can't fulfill a wish Shiva is finished they open a second letter at the lawyer's office and they read the following my dear sons I know that by now you're reading this you discovered that Chiva Kadisha did not allow you to bury me with socks on so I know I'm without socks but I specifically asked you to do it to show you that regardless of how many roads I build and buildings that I build and cash I had in a bank and people that called and praised my name when you leave this world they won't even let you take your socks <laughs> the only thing that I have is mitzvot and that's the only thing you're gonna have when you leave now you can listen to me saying these stories or you can listen to the doctor that's been killing people for the last few hundred years the un, the non-jewish perception of holiness is part of the reason of why we are confused at being a holy person Hashem says Kedoshim to you ki kadosh ani. Hashem says you be holy because I am holy we get scared of being holy we get scared of keeping Shabbat being modest we get scared of these things why it's so much different than everybody else 
we start thinking about, wait, if I start keeping Shabbat, that means I can't work as much. If I start keeping mitzvot, that means I can't really cheat in business. If I start doing this, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do a lot of things. We start getting scared. We start thinking that we're going to lose money out of it. We're going to go homeless. We're going to be this. We're going to be these poor little people. People throw rocks on. That's what we think. That's the Yetzirah put it in our, part, in our hand. The problem is the Yetzirah just put the little seed in our head in the beginning. He said, no, no, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. But he didn't actually mean for you to stay that way. He just gave you an obstacle. What ends up happening is that we take what the Yetzirah really seriously. To such a point, he says, no, no, I didn't mean for you not to learn Torah. I just wanted to give you an obstacle. No, no, I didn't mean for you to go to the strip club. I just told you, yeah, there's stuff there. No, I didn't mean for you to do all these things. I just, Yetzirah says, hey, you're on your own, buddy. I'm not even influencing you. There are some people are such a shayim. They're making so many sins. The Yetzirah himself says, what are you doing? It's not the Yetzirah. That's what, they, that's what the Rabbi Saimi Salam says. It's not the Yetzirah anymore. They're on their own. They like the sin. They like going gambling in a casino. They like it. They like seeing girls that are not their wife. They like pornography. They like wasting seed. They like non-kosher food. They like it. They like the sin. So when you tell them you have to do tshuva, it's hard for me. What do you mean it's hard for you? You're a Jew. You're a Jew. What do you mean it's hard for you? Hashem created you to do this. Moshe Rabbeinu says to Am Yisrael, it's in your mouth. It's, uh, it's in your heart to do it, meaning that's why you were created. What do you mean it's hard for you? Hard for you to make money, but you still did it. Hard for you to find a wife, but you still did it. Hard for you to do that, but you did it. What do you mean it's hard for you? Well, hard for you, you're going to do it anyway? Or hard for you like you're giving up before you started? Hard for you giving up before you started? Oh, it's not the Yetzirah, it's you. You like the sin. It's not the Yetzirah, it's you. You just enjoy the sin too much. You are trying to blame the Yetzirah. It's not the Yetzirah. Yetzirah didn't do that. It's you. You like the sin too much. You like the heroin. You like the cocaine. Even after you found out it kills people. Even after you found out it's bad for you. But you like it. That's not Yetzirah. That's us. And when you tell people, listen, the things you think about religious people, they're wrong. You can prove it, it's all wrong. The things you think about the Torah, it's wrong. You can prove that it's wrong. It's like, no, what are you talking about? Look, these religious people, they have to be poor. No, the only Goim say stuff like that. Only the Goim think that being holy means being poor. Strangely, none of their holy people, so-called holy people, are actually poor. The Vatican is the richest entity on the planet. The second richest entity is the Avodah Zarah in India. Second richest entity in the world. Real holiness. Just like the heroin and the morphine from the doctors. Godliness does not mean living in isolation Godliness does not mean that a person has to rid himself of all the materialism in the world. Hashem created material in order for you to benefit from it, in order for you to serve Him with it. But you can use everything He created for good and for bad. You can use the phone to do good things or bad things. You can go on the internet on your phone and look at pornography and destroy your olam haba every second over and over again to no end. Or you can go to Be'ezrat Hashem and watch the Shiur Torah and create a good Olam Abba. You can use your car to run over this guy that cuts you off. Or you can use your car to come to a Shiur Torah. You can use a book to throw it at somebody in your class because he ticked you off and hit him in the head nice and be happy for two seconds before the cops come because... He passed out because of you. Or you can read the book and make sure that book is a Sefer Torah and learn from it and do what it says. Everything in life can be used for good and for bad. Everything. To say 
just because you become a Shomer Shabbat, Shomer Mitzvot, Shomer Torah, and so on, that means that there's no materialism. It's not Torah. Only Goyim think like this. Only fools think like this. This is not Da Torah. Da Torah is, yes, there's materialism in the world. Use it for good. There's ways to make money. Make the money in a kosher way. Once you have the money, use the money in a kosher way. Everybody thinks that, oh, if I do tshuva, I have to leave my job, I have to leave my wife. No, you don't have to leave anything. You just have to do everything a kosher way. It, sometimes, there's no way of doing something a kosher way. Like if you have a bar, there's no way to have a kosher bar, unless you make it a men's only bar, which I highly doubt you'll survive. There's no way to have a kosher bar. There's no way to have a kosher nightclub. There's no way to have a uh, kosher mixed dancing. There's no way to do that. There's certain things, there's just no way. Somebody asked me today, is there a, uh, is it okay if I open this new business that promotes Hashem Yachem, Hashem Yachem, Hashem Yachem, but I uh, can't even tell you what it is, Hashem Yachem, I'm thinking about it right now. Is there a way that I can do it in a kosher way if I give myself? There's no way to do there's certain things. You can't do kosher way. But the vast majority of things, you can. Vast majority of things, you can do in a kosher way. All the Torah is saying, do kosher things in a kosher way. That's it. Kosher marriage in a kosher way. Kosher food, eat in a kosher way. Even food, just because it's kosher, doesn't mean you're allowed to eat it. Doesn't mean you're allowed to eat it. Why? There's certain times to eat, there's certain times not to eat. If you eat it on Yom Kippur, it's not kosher. If you eat the pita on Pesach, it's not kosher. If you overeat, it's not kosher. If you're disgusting when you eat, it's not kosher. Even if the food is kosher. Meaning... We have simple guideline from Hashem that says kosher way to do everything. Every desire you have. And you're not going to lose out for it. In fact, you're going to gain. The Torah gives a person, the Dalke Yoshel says, the Torah gives a person a way to sanctify all facets of human existence. You could literally make your phone holy. By using it to watch you at Torah. You could literally make your car, your car, a Kli Kodesh. By using it to go to shul, using it to come to shul Torah, and not using it for the garbage of the world. You can turn your clothes into something holy that it's a mitzvah to buy it. Mitzvah, mitzvah to buy clothes. If it's modest. If a woman buys Modest clothes, it's 100% a mitzvah. That the Gemara says in Masechet Rosh Hashanah in Beitzah, Hashem will pay 100%. Modest clothes, not what you think is modest, what's really modest. Shop away, honey. Shop away as long as it's modest, but not according to your opinion, according to Torah's opinion. Not the way you translated the Torah. And that's what we have next. We have a problem. We have a problem that people want to translate the Torah their own way and they don't want to believe what it says. This is the reason why only 13% of American Jews avoid using money on Shabbat because they are so afraid to lose this money that almost 90% of American Jews hold on to it and use it on Shabbat because they like their money much more than they like God because they believe that if you're a religious Jew, you're going to be poor and broke. But statistics show that regardless of whether a person is religious or not, Orthodox Jews, you can see statistics. The PEW research says Orthodox Jews who observe Shabbat are just as likely to earn over $150,000 a year as any other Jew. The guy that has a kippah 
learns Torah every day, goes to Shul Torah, fulfills the Torah, he's just as likely to make a nice six-figure income to do whatever it is that he needs to do in life. But he makes $150,000 and his money is kosher and his job is holy. The secular person makes $150,000, his job is a sin. Why? He's not using it for the right reasons. The problem is that because we are weak to the extent that we want to translate the Torah to our own likings, we allow the Amalek inside our own people. I'll give you a couple of new examples. Recently, uh, uh, the journalist Shaulson that I told you that uh, uncovered a few things that we talked about recently says that right now, there's a blog he came out with a few days ago, three or four days ago. It says, One of the biggest problems that the world of Orthodox, ultra-religious Jews are dealing with right now is that the missionaries have entered the ultra-Orthodox world. How have they entered it? I've told you guys that they had somebody they paid off to translate the False Testament into Yiddish. I told you guys that they also convinced a few teachers in Yeshivot, in Lakewood, in Muncie, in other places to missionize, to teach New Testament undercover. If that's not bad enough, they now caught people in the Kashrut department. People in the Kashrut department, Mashgiach Kashrut, a Mashgiach Kashrut who is a missionary. How come nobody says anything? Because he looks more religious than everybody else here. Black and white, payers, beard, nice and groomed from Mount Sinai goes to Minyan, prays with everybody, missionary built, believes in idolatry. Is like a messianic Jew? No, he is a idol worshiper. He's an idol worshiper, but he's a Jew. Khalidi, but he's a Jew. But he's an idol worshiper. Why? Because the missionaries told him and the rest of his buddies that followed, don't change anything. Keep going to shul. Keep the look the way you look. Don't move out. Why? We need you to spread the mission. And now they have a serious problem. Why? These people are not regular religious Jews. They're in some of the most famous and strongest Hasidut in the world. Hasidut Satmel. And others, of course. But this Mashgiach and other people, some of them are, have high level positions, very important jobs. People go to them for Pesach to kasher their, their, their kelim. Guess what? The kelim are not kosher. He's an idol worshiper. The kelim, the pots and pans are not kosher anymore. Why? He's an idol worshiper. How does such a thing happen? Chain is only as strong as its weakest link. We let falsehood into our schools because we let falsehood into our own hearts. To believe that this is okay, but not everything else. This is okay, but not everything else. So you're going to see sometimes from different places that they're very, very stringent about Chalav Yisrael. You drink regular kosher milk, they're going to treat you like a goy. But to put idol worship on their head as a wig, no problem. To pray to uh, the Rebbe, no problem. To steal in business, no problem. But you drank non-kosher milk, oh, yeah. shake it, shake it. Why? Demented ideology. We let one thing in, rest of it now.
That goes into our hearts, and then it goes into our schools. Then it goes into the so-called Kiruv organizations. Kiruv organization by the name of Bima, Bina, the Bina program. The Bina program of OFJCC wrote the following. Those books referring to the Torah do not belong only to the Orthodox. They want to open a secular yeshiva. They're part of our culture. And we need to study them and do our own commentary. And it will be different commentary than how the Orthodox read them. Your average secular ignorant person is going to be the new Rashi. And Jick, Jick, this person's name Jick. I don't know what parent names their kid Jick. Miskinal. Jick insists that this is no contradiction. No contradiction of using sacred texts to support their es- efforts. No, because they get millions of dollars for it. That's why there's no contradiction. There's no contradiction that you can study these texts in a non-religious set, uh, setting and make a process more egalitarian and open to everyone including goyim including non-jews what didn't you call it a yeshiva what's yeshiva about it call it public school at least be, be intellectually honest and this is the best and worst part at the same time She's quoted as saying the following. We don't see the Torah as obligating. We see it as inspirational. We don't learn the laws of Shabbat hoping that you'll go home and actually do it. We're hoping you'll understand the tradition. Meaning, they have zero interest in you keeping Shabbat. In fact, it would be the opposite of their intention. Their intention is just to understand the cultural aspect of it. Like they've turned the Torah into a history book, Chas v'shalom, which the Zohar Kadosh says that anyone that says the Torah is a history book has lost their right to live. Now before anybody decides that they want to be the next Rashi, before anybody wants to decide that they're uh, just going to simply ignore everything, you should know who Rashi was. Rashi said a few things about this Mishnah. But first we need to know who, who we're dealing with here. There's a person by the name of Rabbi Yitzchaki. Rabbi Yitzchaki married for a long time, no kids. His wife simply could not have kids. No kids. He was a simple person, learned a little Torah. In our version, it's a lot of Torah. And didn't have much money. But one day he finds a very valuable stone that's priceless. As it happens, he brings it to the jeweler who says let me work on it for you and I'll get a customer Hashem makes it so that some idol worshiping king wants a new uh, wants this specific jewel and he's willing to pay millions and millions of dollars for it making a beats hockey the richest pe- person in the entire country he sends his, uh, the king sends a couple of his servants, go pick up this stone, go pick up this guy, bring him over here, I want to honor him as I buy the stone, make a whole ceremony out of it. Abit Saki says farewell to his wife, I'm going on a boat, I'll be back in a few months, I'm going to sell this and come back with 
instead of one stone, a boatload worth of gold. As he's on the boat, he overhears the two servants chit-chatting about the stone and how happy the king is going to be once he's able to put the stone in his statue. In his statue of idolatry. As soon as Rabbi Yitzhaki heard this, he says, wait, they're going to put this stone in a statue? I'm going to be involved in honoring an idol? I'm going to be involved in, in benefiting from idolatry? Impossible. But what do I do? I'm already on the boat. If I tell them I don't want to sell it, they're just going to kill me and take the stone anyway. And then I was involved anyway, because even though I didn't know, still, it gets to the destination. He thought about it. He decided to do something none of us would do. He pretended to slip, fall, and drop the priceless blue stone in the middle of the ocean. The two servants saw him, and then he pretended to cry hysterically that he can't believe that he just lost the, uh, the precious diamond. The two guys felt so bad for him, they didn't kill him. By the time they got to the other side, the king was ready for them. He said, no, no, you don't want to know, poor guy. He lost the stone. The guy was going to become the richest guy in the country. Now he's the biggest loser in the world. They felt so bad for him, they let him go. As soon as he got off the boat on the way back home, happy as can possibly be that he just lost a hundred million dollars and has no chance whatsoever of ever getting this money back but he was not involved in idolatry he celebrated he danced and an old man grabbed him looked at him in the eye and both of his eyes were bluer than the stone and told him you gave up the priceless blue stone. You gave up priceless possessions in this world. A stone that brought light to the world. As on Hashem's name, you will have a son that will bring light to the world. His wife. His wife. You don't get a husband like this if you're just a uh, wife. Doesn't want to send people to Shio Torah. His wife was Kodesh Kodeshim. So much so the Christians wanted to kill her. One day they trapped her. It was a narrow, narrow uh, road. On the right side was the shul, the building shul, the building of the synagogue. On the other side was a different building, but it was very narrow. The Christians decided they're going to have fun. What? They're going to put two horse carriages with running horses to fill up the entire road. And run full speed. When? As she's walking and she can't run away. The woman that can't bring a kid to the world. The woman that her husband just gave up the world. Of money. All she did was lay back on the, on the wall of the synagogue. And the wall accepted her inside of the synagogue. Shtabach Shimonad. They say until this day you could see the indent of how the wall accepted her body into the synagogue. Lived to say the third part of the story. When a woman gives up everything for Hashem, to publicize his name, to send her husband to Shul Torah, to learn Torah. When a man gives up everything for Hashem, to show him that all the money in the world is not worth even one sin. What do you think Hashem does? Hashem fixes the uterus of the woman and if that's not enough, He gives them a son. A son that will bring light to the world. A son by the name of Rashi. That's Rashi. Rashi also stands for Rabban Shel Israel, The Rabbi of Am Israel. Why? Because Rashi Rabotai Karim, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, is his name. Rashi, who lived almost a thousand years ago, 950 years ago, 
brought light to the world that we can't live without. He put commentary on the Gemara, almost 80% of the Gemara has his commentary on it, that without it, you cannot read the Gemara. If you don't have his commentary, simply the Gemara, just, it's better off you keep it closed. Why? You won't understand a single word. He wrote commentary on the Tanakh, especially the Chumash, that if you don't read his commentary, you, you get practically a Christian. Because you won't understand a single word. His commentary is so extraordinary, there are over 300 super commentaries based on his commentary. His kids and grandkids were Gdolei Ador, the Tosfot, Rabbeinu Tam, giants among giants. How did it all go? How did it all happen? How did somebody get so lucky? It's not lucky. It's also not easy. It's sacrifice. It's sacrifice that most people think is too big for them. Because they think that you'll lose out by fulfilling the will of Hashem. Reality is you only win when you fulfill the will of Hashem. In this world and the next. So this same Rashi says that the Torah's healing power can overcome all the physical and spiritual maladies of this world. Meaning that if you have a spiritual problem or a physical problem, you have chas shalom cancer, or you have shalom bayit issues. You have panasa problems, or you have AIDS. You have a uh, difficulty understanding a certain gemara, a difficulty remembering anything, or a difficulty getting out of the bathroom. You have a problem, there's one cure, which is the cure to everything. Reading, learning, fulfilling the Torah. That's the cure. Ba'olam and Ba'olam Because the Torah, its greatness is not limited to material greatness. Material greatness is something that you leave here. Even if you got to wealth and extraordinary and so on, at best, at best you get to enjoy it here. At best other people compliment you about it here. At best. Torah is something that you get here and there because the greatness of Torah is exemplified by the fact that even though this world and the next world are diametrically opposite one another, the Torah has the power to grant man life and happiness in both worlds. Evan Shlema says. Because the Torah is the source of life in both worlds. Not just this world and not just the next. The key is to take Hashem's word for it. Take our rabbi's word for it. Take these giant sages' word for it. When the rabbi said it, he was serious. When the sages said it, they were serious. They weren't joking around. They didn't research it for three or four years and then you know, go on to something else. They spent a lifetime doing it, living it. Fulfilling it. Some of these people that you've never heard of had greater wisdom than anybody on earth today. You can't even compare the, the intellect of the stipler Gaon next to any, any person that's called Gaon in the secular world. They're closer to a monkey than they are to him. You can't compare any scholar, scientist, engineer, physicist, or whatever to Rav Ovadia. You can't compare them. There's no comparison. It's not like, oh, he, Rav Vadya is a 10 and he's like a 7. No, it's, he's a 0 in comparison to him. Zero. Zero, the same equivalent of like a monkey. Zero. Why? It's a different world. But people insist on trying something else. So much so that I heard a few days ago one of the most baffling and demented stories I think I've heard at least in recent past. This woman called Ellen DeGeneres. 
famous uh, comic or something. It's a comic what she says, actually. She says to people on her show, we went to an ice cream shop, kosher, Baruch Hashem, and they had a TV, not such a kosher TV, but TV. And you overhear this TV, and I had this Ellen DeGeneres show. And I couldn't help overhearing it. And she tells her fans, which apparently are millions and millions of people that watch her every day, like as if it's like uh, Mount Sinai, and all cheering, yay, yay, yay. And you find out later on that she's a lesbian, married to a woman, and gal nefesh. But everybody's like, yay, Ellen, yay, 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 you're an enemy of Hashem, yay. Now you would think, oh, this person, at least maybe she got the, she, okay, she has a desire, she likes women, no good. Okay, she has fame, she has, okay, so hopefully she's like smart. Hopefully she's like good, right? Why? Because on our show she tells people she does good things. One of the good things she says, please everyone, if you want to join me on this project, on this very, very important project, donate to my charity. She has a charity apparently because we have a foundation to save the mountain gorillas in Rwanda. We have a foundation, a multi-million dollar foundation to save mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Now, this would be funny if it wasn't true. Now, I couldn't take it. The whole way home, I'm talking to my wife and she's talking to me like, is this real? Is this, is this, maybe it's a joke? Maybe she's a comic, maybe it's a joke. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna spend at least 10 minutes of bathroom time finding out about monkeys, gorillas in Rwanda. I wanna know how many of these gorillas are in the mountains, not, not any gorilla. It has to be a mountain gorilla, guys. A mountain gorilla, how many of them are in Rwanda? And how come they need so much money, these gorillas? The people don't have any money. But the, the monkeys need money. So I did some research for you. Right now, dangerous situation. Pikuach Nefesh. There are 1,006, exactly, 1,006 mountain gorillas. Some of them live in the mountains of Rwanda. Now, this preservation, this zoo in Rwanda, is where people visit to see the mountain gorillas. And they bought, even though the people over there don't have food to eat, but they bought four gorillas, four gorillas for $1.6 million, which means $400,000 a gorilla. Now, if this wasn't funny enough, let me just show you how stupid Hashem makes certain people because of their own stupidity. Why are these gorillas almost extinct? Why? There are only a thousand of them. Like, why? Well, the people of Rwanda apparently like to eat them once in a while. Some of them like to take their head and put it as a nice chandelier. So they like the head. They like the food. Some are just getting sick. So that's what's happening. But really, some are just simply being sold in the black market. That's really the big thing. The black market. The evil, dangerous black market. So how much does a gorilla, how much does a mountain gorilla from Rwanda cost in the black market? Now to buy four of them, the zoo paid $1.6 million. That means if you wanted to buy all thousand, I mean, you have to be a billionaire. So how much? I mean, the black market. Black market, I mean, I, I never knew that Rwandan people have such billions of dollars to buy the, the, the monkeys in a black market. Guess what? You can buy a mountain gorilla in a black market for $1,000. Maximum price. If he's extra muscular, 5000 Wikipedia. 
Maximum price for 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 a mountain gorilla is five thousand dollars, which means that this million and a half dollars they could have simply bought all of the black market. <laughs> They could have bought all of them. In fact, they could have bought all of them and still had a million dollars left to feed the poor people of Rwanda. <laughs> if this wasn't true, it would be funny, but I mean, seriously. Guess what? Millions of dollars are being donated to this stupidity. Millions of dollars, their annual budget is five million dollars or more. For what? How many bananas can the mountain gorilla eat? <laughs> but you see, Rabotai, it's funny, but it's true. You have a certain millionaire in Israel decided he wanted to do a mitzvah. So he donated a fence to the Noahide Zoo for the elephant called Bracha. For Ilui Nishma. Eloi Nishmat of his mom, his poor mother, what did she get? She left a son in the world that has a fence for an elephant. It's his mother's fault. It's not his fault. It's his mother's fault that our whole Lamba is full of elephant poop on a fence. Because she chose the shortcut. Shortcut is the long cut. So we see here that really... It's not just the benefits that a person gets in Olam Abba, where their son, Chas Shalom and their daughter is not going to buy them a fence for an elephant to poop on, or a gorilla from Rwanda. Because if you fulfill Torah, your son is most likely going to buy you a mitzvah, Sefer Torah, Shas, Talmit Chacham, Tzadikim, grandchildren. That's what you get in Olam Abba. You get grandkids that, Shtabach Shimo, can continuously bring your neshama higher and higher like Moshe Rabbeinu. But even more so, you benefit in this world. You benefit in this world that your brain is not going to be spiritually stupid to make such stupid investments, stupid moves in your life, just pure stupidity. It's not even like, it's, it's just, it's pure stupidity. The Torah protects you from our own stupidity. 